Welcome to the Dice Towers Summer Spectacular, a five-day streaming event with top ten lists, live plays, a host of board game fanatics, and more. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the, what is it, fourth day of our Summer Spectacular. I am joined today by Zev. From WizKids, how you doing, Zev? I'm fine, man. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. We're, we're up. We're ready to go. Absolutely. We're going to be talking about <laughs> a whole bunch of upcoming games from WizKids. I'm very excited. I just got a quick uh, peek at some of these. So we're going to dive right into it, almost. Right before we start, though, I want to mention a little giveaway. Uh, don't forget, by the way, if you've entered anything yesterday as a giveaway, the, uh, the winners are going to be... Announced today, this morning. Just go to our website, dicetower.com. You can see some winners there. But before we get going here, Zev, let me mention a new contest for this morning. We've nice. got for you, everybody, two copies of um, Imperial Settlers Barbarian Hordes expansion. The brand new expansion to uh, Empires of the North from Portal Games. And a big thank you to Portal Games for those. So we're going to give away two copies of that. This is North America only. And as usual, the way you enter this is by sending us an email at uh, contest at dicetower.com. And in the subject line, you are going to write Hordes. H-O-R-D-E-S. Hordes. In the body of the message, make sure you include your name and your address, and we're going to pick a couple of winners. You'll know about it tomorrow. Again, North America only, two copies of Barbarian Hordes for Empires of the North. Thank you to Portal one more time. All right, let's switch to this right now. And Zev, from what I understand, like I said, we got a bunch of stuff, but we're going to be talking about first Stampede coming out from WizKids. Yes, indeed, indeed. <laughs> what is Stampede, uh, Zev? Uh, uh, Stampede is a card game, two to six players. Uh, it is about collecting stamps with animals on it. And the uh, the goal of the game is to have five of each, I'm sorry, five of one animal in your display, or at least one of each of the nine animals in your display. Um, each, it's a simple game, you draw a card, and then you play a card and then activate its ability. Each animal has its own ability. And they're all exchanges. See, we're all stamp collectors. We're, you know, we're, we're fair. We don't, we don't try to steal from other people without giving something back uh, and so on. So everything's in exchange. You can exchange with cards in your album with opponent's album or with opponent's hand or your hand for their hand or the stamp exchange with your hand or, the, uh, uh, or your album. So it's always... Whatever you give, you're either exchanging one card or three cards, depending on the animal. Uh, and if you see on the cover here, you see some. Yeah, of let the me switch. Uh, I'm actually not. I'm. I'm still with just on our shot. I'm going to switch over to your desktop. Oh. To whoa, show yeah. people the cover there. There it is. Very nice There's cover. The cover. Stampy. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, yep. So this is uh, some of the stamps and some of the animals that you'll see in the game. And I'll. Uh, so here, as I said, the game is, right, you draw a card, you play a card, you perform that card's action. Very nice family-friendly game, two to six players. It plays well at two. It's a little more, you know, cutthroat uh, a bit. Uh, and at higher play accounts, it can get a little more chaotic, but there's a lot of things going on um, because there's so many ways to, to, uh, to, to interact with the other players because you're, again, uh, a lot of times taking cards uh, out of their hands while giving them your cards or out of their albums and so on and so forth. Plus, you can also exchange with your own hand and album at times. Uh, I have a display here of here's like some of the uh, the animals, some of the cards. So it's all icons. Uh, yeah, these, the this artwork is gorgeous, man. I love this bold, striking artwork. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we wanted to be uh, uh, very different with it. Uh, and also, uh, the designer spent many years developing the icons. So that uh, people can uh, immediately grok them, uh, mm -hmm. or or soon after learning them, grok them. Uh, so, for example, the lion here, you'll see there's an exchange. The double arrows is always the exchange, and all the cards uh, have that. Uh, so you'll notice that you have two books in front of the lion. The uh, book on the bottom with the the blue, the white uh, blue, is your album, 
and anything with a red outline means your opponent. So what you're saying here is when you play the lion, you get to exchange one card from your album into an opponent's album, and you take one card from their album and put it in your album. Sure. So yeah. that's what that does there. The Rhino, for example, says you take your three cards, you put them in the deck, and from the deck, you take three new cards. So again, it's an exchange with the deck. And the elephant on the left there, you see you take one card from your hand to put in your album. You take one card from the album and put it in your hand. Yep. So very, very simple. Very clean. But, but yep, yeah, and there are six <clears> more <throat> animals, and they all have different abilities. The only one that doesn't have an exchange is the parrot. Uh, the parrot just allows you to win if you have four of a kind of that parrot. Uh, so so the, the yeah, the album uh, that you are referencing here is it is it just an area in front of you on the table? Is that yes, how that's, that's going to work out. Book. Correct. That that's just the area in front of your table. We call it your stamp album, uh, and that's where you play cards. So again, when you draw a card, you play a card into your album, and then you uh, activate the action, which is some sort of an exchange somewhere hand. Right deck, the stamp exchange, or with your opponent's uh, album or hand. Uh, I show you the back of the cards here because what's important is if you notice all the backs of the card have two animals on them, mm -hmm. what that means is uh, one, the, the front of the card is going to be one of these animals. So if you look at the bottom right there, you have an elephant and a, um, a bull. The, it's, the card is going to be one of those things. And that's important because uh, as I said, part of the game is you're trying to get five of one animal or one each of the nine animals. This sort of gives you an idea hmm. of what an opponent has in their hand. That's really neat. Point. I like that a lot. I like a, a little bit of the um, a little information, possibly. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's interesting. Exactly. Correct. You get a little bit of information, and then you can determine, oh, should I mess with that that person right now, or should I wait? You know, like, oh, they don't have, you know, they have four uh, uh, baboons, for example, in their in their display. Do they have a fifth one? Uh, now, if they had this hand here, you would say, oh, man, yeah, they have two chances here. The two card, the middle and the left, uh, is showing a baboon. And you're like, well, that might be the fifth baboon. So I got to be careful as to, uh, you know, uh, what I need to do next. Um, and yeah, and that's uh, that Stampede. Two to six player. It takes about 20 minutes or so to play. That one is uh, should be available if not now, very, very soon, probably later in the month. Okay, all right. We're going to come back to us for a second. I'll let you look for the next thing. <clears throat> and we are going to be talking about next Arcade... Well, this is a longer title. The Arcade Mega is... Fighter has like a really long title. What is it? <laughs> it's uh, Ultra Deluxe 2D Arcade Mega Fighter. <laughs> all right. And right. I would say it used to have a longer name. I think we cut it down by like one or two words. <laughs> Ultra Deluxe 2D Arcade Mega Fighter. Correct. All right. <laughs> so, okay, let's uh, go ahead and cut to your desktop here and let's take a look at that, Zev. There we go. All right, this is uh, some, some insanity going on on that screen. We've got a dinosaur with a wizard's hat, a gorilla yes. wearing That's... armor. <laughs> Uh, there's a guy wielding a shark like a like a rocket launcher. No, that's shark fist. It's Sh tied to his hand. Shark fist. Go the, ahead. Uh, Go ahead. The dinosaur with the the wizard is a tyrannosaurus. <laughs> oh man. Okay. The uh, the gorilla is the pogorilla. He's on a pogo stick. Oh, okay. I missed that. Got it. Uh, the uh, the lady above uh, the gorilla is uh, amoeba bandita. Uh, okay. To the left of her is um, La, uh, I think Lolly. She's uh, got like a the, big candy cane and lollipop. Candy, yeah, she has a lot of candy powers. And the uh, the last one, the uh, the octopus thing is Cycloptopus or Cycloptopus. That's it. <laughs> so yes, you could tell it's it's uh, uh, it's meant to be humorous. Yes, uh, it's a uh, it's a two player game. And it evokes the feeling of like the team arcade battle. So it's a three versus three battle. So you're going to be drafting. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can pull them here. So you'll be drafting out of the 15 different fighters. Uh, so here you have Bunny and Carrot and Colder Geist. There's a couple others. Um, you'll be drafting three fighters uh, each player. It's a two player game. Okay. And one is going to be your frontline fighter, and the other two are going to be on your sideline fighters. And your frontline fighter is the one going to be attacking. But one of the actions you have is you can swap out 
a sideline fighter to become a front line, front line fighter. So it's how you interact with your fighters, uh, like when to move them up, when to keep them back, how to protect them, uh, and so on, to keep them alive. Uh, mm -hmm. The object of the game, of course, is to KO uh, all the fighters of your opponents. Okay, so uh, this kind of sounds like a perverse twist on Pokemon or something like that. I mean. <laughs> yes, yes. You're not summoning them or anything, uh, but you are playing button cards. Uh, so you can see, for example, if you look at Bunny and Carrot, uh, the middle card, uh, you have the Chomp and Stomp. So if you play a blue and a yellow card, you can you can activate the Chomp and Stomp uh, oh. attack, uh, and it tells you it does one damage to a frontline fighter, and then opponent discards one card. Now on your further on your turn. Uh, so the other actions you can be, you have three actions. So you can start a combo, you can string a combo, you can swap fighters, uh, you can uh, taunt, which means you get super tokens, which powers up some of the attacks. If you look at the, the, the yellow bar attack, the third attack is always the ultimate attack. Okay. And you always have to spend super tokens. So the beaster bunny, uh, for example, for bunny and carrot, you need two yellows and five super tokens right. to, uh, to attack. And that one you do four damage to a frontline fighter. The opponent gains no super tokens from the attack, and Bunny and Carrot heals two wounds. So it's a, they're very powerful, the attacks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, what I was saying is that so you could do uh, uh, play blue and yellow, do the chomp and stop. But let's say that you don't have the cards to continue with Bunny and Carrot to attack. So you ended up with a yellow. But you know what? You have another yellow in your hand, let's say. So you can use an, uh, uh, an action to swap a fighter, make colder geist, let's say your frontline fighter, mm -hmm. and then by playing another yellow, now you can do the scurry flurry attack because now it's two yellows and you had a yellow from previous plus a yellow now, and now you can do the scurry flurry attack, which allows you to do two damage to a frontline fighter, and then opponent must swap with a sideline fighter. Okay, so you can do little so, combos because you can use that exactly, card for both. Yeah. Exactly. So it all depends on what button cards you have in your hand and then how to manipulate so that you can play more attacks with less cards and fewer actions, of course. Um, each fighter also has two abilities, which you uh, see on the bottom of the cards. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them can be played on an opponent's turn. Some of them can only be played uh, on your turn. Some are, are, are um, uh, triggers, so they're reactive. And then there are some that uh, will only work, like Amoeba, Amoeba Bandita. She only works, the cytoplasm only works when she's in in the front and then it says opponent fighters can't heal so if she's the frontline fighter then no opponent can heal so that's just it so we do again a lot of funny names uh very uh but very arcade style you're playing the button cards i don't know if i have uh let's see if i have uh so here you'll see some example of button cards here uh here's the frank furderer uh, he has a, a weenie gun a kraut bomb a meat seeker and his two abilities are relish and chaos and ketchup and mustard Oh my um, goodness! This is amazing. <laughs> so, thank you. so you can see the button cards. So for example, <laughs> you have a red one here, uh, and also actually, when there's a single uh, color, you also get a a, um, a resource. So if I just play this red card, see the star here, it tells you I get a super token. Okay. Uh, I don't know okay. if I have a sleigh of another button here. Uh, okay, this is just more. Oh, slumberjack and the tyrannosaurus. As you can see, uh, it's a two more uh, uh, fighter cards there. And you can see they have the hit points. Uh, usually it runs from like 8 to about 11, maybe 12. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, hit points are cumulative, so they stay on a character unless you start healing them. And again, when you reach their maximum, they get KO'd. Uh, and some fighters will also get... Uh, oh, here's some more button cards. Uh, so here you have okay. a blue and a yellow. Some of them have uh, two colors, so you can orient them the way you want. And oh, some of them also okay. have blocks. Yeah. Yeah, so you have, um, so here was the, what I was talking about, the start combo and string combo. So here you can say I play the blue and the yellow, and I get the, the weenie gun attack. And then if I play a red, all of a sudden now I have yellow red. So on the same fighter, I can now play the kraut bomb because I played blue yellow. And then I added a red, so I have yellow red. So I'm able to start combo with a weenie gun and then string a combo and play the kraut bomb. And that's with the same fighter. So I don't. I, so if I got lucky and I had those colors, I didn't have to swap another fighter out. I was able to um, uh, use the same fighter to continue an attack. Right. Uh, but again, right. you get three actions. Yeah. So uh, if you're not wasting your middle action having to swap someone in and out, then you can keep doing more. Right. 
Exactly, exactly. And then there are swap tokens that you can gain. So that allows you to swap fighters for free. And then there are some abilities that either force an opponent to swap or allows you to swap. So it depends on the abilities. Let me just see if I have another uh, button card. No. So uh, so getting back to the... So here you can see three button cards. And I think I had another one. No, we'll do three. So we have single button cards, uh, button cards that have two colors so your right. choice. And the other one is a single color and a shield. So you're able to block some attacks. Uh, so if you play a card from your shield, you'll block that much damage uh, coming in from an attack. Uh, usually you gain a super token once one of your characters takes damage. So at least you get some compensation okay. uh, for it. Um, but when you play a block, you don't. You forego getting a super token because you were able to do a block even if damage goes through. Well, the uh, the artwork and the theme is certainly live up to the ridiculousness I'm seeing on display here. But <laughs> but I'm also seeing more gameplay than I was expecting at first. It's, there's a decent amount going on here. Uh, this is you. this yeah. is interesting. This is captivating. I uh, I could see a knockdown drag out fight going on here that I, I would want to be a part of. So how many players <laughs> is this for again? Uh, two players. So two it's players. Just head to head. Bring, you know, draft your guys, right? Grab your guys, bring them to the table, and, and fight. Okay. And with 15 fighters, you're only playing three on three, so there's multiple combinations uh, that you can have. I think even on the bottom of the box we mentioned, I think it's like a few hundred thousand combos that you can do. Right. Or something like that. But, yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, and yeah, two-player. And it takes about, uh, I'm going to say about 30 to 45 minutes, I believe. So when is this guy coming out, Zev? Uh, I believe it's, if it's not available now, it should be available soon. And, and basically, and, and most of the things that we show, uh, obviously we tell people to, you know, please, if you can get it at your local stores and stuff, absolutely go do that. If you have trouble getting it or there's no store next to you, uh, but you know, obviously with the world, the way it is, uh, we do, uh, uh you can get it online at, uh, shop.wizkids.com. So okay. you can get it on our, uh, uh, on our website. All right, so this is available now or very, very soon. And yes. you mentioned Stampede was a little bit later, right? Uh, I think so. I think you can pre-order it now. Uh, but yes, it should be out. I believe this month is uh, its scheduled thing. You know, a, a lot of things got pushed back. So, sure, and, yeah. And, and I, I don't remember the schedule of all the stuff. No problem, no problem. All right. <laughs> Pretty sure. Well, it looks good so far. You're two for two with me, old buddy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a look at... Let me switch out of here and go to our faces for a moment. <laughs> and we're going to take a look at Red Cap Ruckus. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Red Cap Ruckus. Kind of sounds like an expansion to Arcade Mega Fighter. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but it's its own thing. But it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Much simpler. All right, here we go. Let's take a look at that. I see it's up on your end, so let's take a look at it. Okay, Red Cap Ruckus. I see some gnomes have, having at it. Yes, yeah, so Red Cap is uh, an, uh, an English term for gnomes. Okay. That's, that's what they call them. So that's why uh, we have the Red Cap. And also the fact that you're fighting, uh, they're fighting on top of a mushroom, and mushroom have the Red Cap. There are Red Cap mushrooms, so it's a whole pun and pun and pun. Uh, kind of thing. So okay. uh, you have these uh, uh, tribes of gnomes fighting each other on top of a mushroom. Uh, Red Cap Ruckus, I believe uh, two to four, actually one to four, because there is some solo rules, so you can play uh, one to four players. Uh, you are, let's see if I can get the uh, thing, yep. So you are, um, let me see before I get to that one. So yeah, this is what the table is going to look like. The, the You got a big mushroom stem there. You have the crystal token up on the right there. Huh. Uh, what you're doing is you are, you remember like the in the arcade machines, usually like when you throw a coin down the machine and then a sweeper is like hitting all the coins and you're trying to push them off the edge? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. This is the same thing. So yeah, so your finger is like the sweeper. So you're putting uh, a nice heavy uh, chip uh, of, a, of a gnome onto the board okay. and you're pushing and you're trying to push the other gnomes uh, out of the way and you're trying to drop uh, your opponent gnomes. Basically, you're going to score for the gnomes that you drop on your turn. Huh. Uh, some of yours can fall and you might get you know some negative points in that way. But you are trying to drop the Great Crystal. It's worth like five points or something and that ends the game. Um, 
Let's see if I have another uh, shot there. Sorry. Uh, so you can see the, yes, yeah, so the finger, so it shows you, so the yellow, the, there are borders. Uh, so you take your finger and you're pushing it on the board. Uh, and you are, again, just going to have a big mass of chips on the board. And then they'll start being splayed uh, outwards and off the uh, uh, off the table there. So you like can't, the you can't push, you can't pass your finger past the lip of that. Surf. Exactly. You're you just can't pushing flick, up to the edge. Okay. Up to the edge, right. Your finger can't go on the battlefield. You can't flick. Uh, uh, the token, you have to like just slowly push it, same direction. You can't like wiggle it around. You have to just boop uh, one direction. Uh, up on the screen, you see some of the characters, uh, and they're worth different points. You have like the twin gnomes in the yellow there. You have the vulture gnome on the bottom right there. You have the tenacious gnome. That's the gnome hanging on there. I think with the tenacious gnome, if you knock them down, uh, you can immediately pick them up and use them uh, again. So it's almost like taking an extra turn. Okay. Uh, then you have like, you know, your fighter gnome, your, your fighter gnomes, and then you have champions uh, as well. Do I have another? No. So that's, uh, so that's it. So yeah, really gameplay, very simple, very family friendly. Uh, really anyone can grok it. You put it on the table and anybody walking by could say, yep, I know how to play this game. I mean, really that's simple. You almost yeah. need not except for the, any point values or whatever. But in terms of the mechanisms, you just... Yeah, you you know exactly what to do. So Zev, tell me a little bit about the uh, the construction of this one. I see there a three D display of it. Is this um, just some uh, a tree, a cardboard tree that then you put this top uh, uh, resting on above it? A absolutely, you're correct. So you know a lot of uh, uh, a lot of standees or stuff. They have like the X, like two cardboards that slot slot together. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes the stem. And then you, and then there's some like raised ridges, and you put that mushroom top uh, right on, right onto the stem. So it's actually, you know, about six, seven inches off the table, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a, I think a three piece construction, uh, two for the stem, one for the mushroom top. Okay, and the chips, like you said, they're uh, nice and hardy. They're sort of heavy, heavy yes. poker style chips. I'm guessing, right? Correct. Yeah, they make a very nice thud when they fall off the edge of the uh, uh, of the thing. A nice, almost metallic uh, uh, kind of thud there, a big, heavy plastic uh, with some metallic uh, thud there. The crystal yeah. also is a two plate, uh, th actually a three piece, because I think you slot the the two elements there, and then it fits on the base that you see over there. Right. It's like the it's like the surface we're playing on reversed, upside down, basically. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So you're trying to knock that down. Uh, that's when the game's over. Then there's a couple of other rules. There's some twigs in the game, which you can use to uh, help seed or push chips uh, on the board. I think a lot of that's for solo mode as well or two-player mode. Uh, yeah, with two-player, you would play uh, uh, two colors, but you, you choose one. When you run out of the chips of one color and the game is still going, you use the second color. Uh, and then with the solo mode, there are things where I think you're trying to, uh, I think, um, I think knock down the twigs. Or the or it tells like how like uh, how how many chips do you need to use to get uh, to knock down everything from the top? Okay, uh, but again, very very simple, yeah. fun little family thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's the uh, do you have an idea on the MSRP for this guy? Uh, good question. Uh, it's not more than I, I think it's forty. It's, so it's between thirty and forty. Uh, I think it's probably close to forty dollars. Right. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of get, poker uh, chips and all that, so that's yeah, going to be expensive. You get 40. Yeah, there's like 10 each of the four colors, so you get 40 uh, poker chips. Yeah. Okay. That's, what, what, yeah, that's what drives the cost. And uh, do you know when this is coming out? Uh, this one should be, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say August, September. Okay. So a little bit a little bit after the, uh, the other two we've talked about. All right. Yes. Sounds good. You've got a busy schedule coming up, man. And yes. we're not well, even. A lot, pushed, a lot of it got pushed back. That's why. <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and change gears here. Let's talk about Seastead. All right. I will get that. So go ahead and look that up. What is Seastead? Uh, this I is one I've actually, up. I think, heard about this one. The other ones I had not heard about. Oh, okay. Uh, you know what? I don't have. Uh, I thought I had the cover, but I don't. But it's available. So, Seastead is a two-player game, like in a Cosmos-style box. Mm -hmm. uh, it's set in the world of Flotilla. Right. So, 
I want to say, I want to stress, it's set in the world of Flotilla, right? It's not Flotilla to player. So it's not, it doesn't have that, that changeover mechanic that Flotilla has. Uh, it's actually by two different designers mm-hmm. uh, that we, we adopted the theme to fit their design. But it, it just fits so nicely into the, uh, uh, into the world. So, uh, the, uh, uh, so it's a two-player game. It's a, um, uh, what do you call it, like a, a sh- uh, not like an I split, you choose mechanic, but it's a sharing mechanic. Okay. Uh, basically, when you dive... Uh, let me see if I show some uh, dive cards here. So here I have some dive cards. Uh, dive cards are when you reveal a dive card, you choose one set of resources. Your opponent gets the other set of resources. Oh, okay. And there are four flotilla tiles on the table. So there's always four uh, flotilla tiles. Uh, and the, you gain the resources. They go in your, uh, in your supply. Uh, getting back to the, uh, the board here. Uh, so you have three different, uh, actually you have four different types of wooden components. You have the shipyard, the academy, and the port. And what you'll, and we also have boats. Right. Uh, so you get to, uh, on your turn, if you don't pick a dive card, you could take the build action. So it's either a dive action or a build action. So dive card is, as I said, you just draw a card and you get resources. Your opponent gets resources. Uh, with the shipyard, oh, I'm sorry. With the uh, the build action, you get to build one of these buildings and put them on a space uh, on a flotilla. Okay. And the flotillas have uh, like about six spaces. There's a cost usually to put it on a flotilla. There's also abilities on a flotilla. I apologize, I don't have a uh, a flotilla tile handy. Um, but um, uh, what do you call it? Yeah. And when you finish a uh, like a ro- uh, a row, so let's say if I play all my shipyards. I get to do that ability on the right with the uh, the ship wheel. Right. If I finish a column, which is downwards, I get to do the ability listed on the bottom. And uh, on each row, it's, I, I'm sorry, each column has the same ability. You swap demand tokens. Uh, so, yeah, you're getting points for the stuff where you build. Uh, you have also, uh, let's see, do I have uh, some specialist cards? Hold on. I did see some specialist cards. Uh, those are decree cards. I can get into that shortly. Uh, I thought I had some specialist cards. Yeah, so these are specialist cards. You'll notice some of the artwork is from the Flotilla game. Mm. Uh, so uh, when you place academies, uh, you're able to pick up a, uh, a specialist card. Specialists have uh, many abilities. They're also worth uh, one point for any unused, um, uh, what do you call it, any unused uh, um, uh, specialist. is worth one point at the end of the game, sorry. Okay, uh, okay. But they have good ability, so most likely you're probably going to use them. So, for example, the salvager on the right here says take two cleanup tokens from the supply, and cleanup tokens at the end are also worth one point. You can return one of your ships from any location in the game uh, to the game box. So if you do, you take another cleanup token. So if you have a ship that's not doing anything for you or whatnot, you can get plus one cleanup token. Uh, ships are cool because they help reduce the cost of a building by one resource, but it also helps your opponent. But if your opponent builds on an area with your ship, you get a free resource as well. Interesting. It seems like quite the, quite the balance between, um, giving yourself enough while being careful about what you give your opponent. It seems like almost every action going on here is about what you give up while you're doing what you're doing. Which is Absolutely. very interesting. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of parameters that are about giving up something, and while you get something, and which choice do you make? When do you do it? What do you give exactly. them? Exactly. Perfect. Yeah, you got you encapsulized it uh, perfectly. It's it's really a matter of right. How badly do I need something, and how much will it help? Will, will it help my opponent more than me? Right. So it's it's really. But no matter what, you're going to help your opponent in some way. You're just hoping that your choice will help you more whether in the short term or in the long term. Right, uh, right, that right. Is a decision. And that's a lot of the decisions in terms of like where you build, uh, when you build, when you dive, uh, and so on. Uh, so also there's a solo mode in the game. So I did say it's two-player, but there is a solo mode. Okay. And also, if you notice, like the specialists have A and B here, that's because the flotillas have an A side and a B side. Um, so the base game is all A side. And if you want... Uh, more a strategy and more different ways of playing. The flotillas have a B side, which now you can use the B um, uh, uh, specialist, and also that's where the decree cards 
uh, come into action, which I had right over here. Right. So these are cards that you can gain. And again, they do uh, different abilities. So for example, uh, Scuttle Fleet on the left there that says when a building is placed at a space containing one of your ships, you could return the ship to the box and take two resources of your choice. So they just add another set of cards that in which you can uh, utilize uh, some extra uh, abilities. All right, it looks gotcha. good. Yeah, I like the I like the look of this. I like the sound of it. One of my favorite games is um, Abyss, which is all about yeah. that give and take. That that I give you something to get something. So this is uh, this seems like something I'm really going to enjoy. I love that idea. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. This one, uh, I think we're also looking at probably September, October. Okay. So we're moving further out a bit. All right. Start saving money, folks, because, uh, you know, September, August, September, October, you're going you're gonna to need some money for some WizKids <laughs> games, I'm telling you. All right. I very nice, so, Zev. Yes. <laughs> looking good. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at Super Skill Pinball. See how many more of these you've got quite the I mean quite the slate. Let's see how many more of these we can talk about here. You got it. Yeah, you just tell me when, my friend. No problem. We're good. We yeah, have to make just, it. We have to make it to at the very least a game, an epic game known as Waddle Downtown. <laughs> All right, super skill pinball. I see you got it up on the screen there. Let's take a look at that. All right, so Super Skill Pinball is a one-to-four player roll-and-write game with a pinball theme. Mm -hmm. uh, we, a few months ago, we released a, uh, a print-and-play version of the first table, Carnival. Uh, not full color, but it was playable uh, uh, for people to test the game. And there's even videos on how to play it and even a playthrough, uh, which we've shown in various uh, formats. So you can definitely, I think you could probably still find that on BGG. Uh, or uh, other uh, resources that you can uh, uh, where you can download the the print and play as well, and also the print and play from our website and maybe even also the video on how to play the game. So you can check our website or other uh, on-site resources. Okay. So we've shown um, uh, Carnival. So this is the full color version of Carnival. Uh, so there are four different pinball tables in the game, and there are four. Uh, four copies of each thing. So again, if you're playing with four people, you can play. Four players can play Carnival. Uh, each and each pinball table comes with two sheets. Basically, the table, which is on the bottom here, mm -hmm. and then the back glass, uh, which is the term uh, in pinball, the thing, the stand, the thing on top of the the pinball machine. So you right. have the name of the of the machine with some artwork on the left. We have on this table, you have the scoring. So these are the stars, uh, and then you can nudge. Nudge is the ability to, uh, since you can't physically nudge uh, this thing, we call it nudge where you, uh, well, let me get into quick uh, the, the gameplay. You roll two dice, everyone shares the two dice. You roll two dice and you choose one of the dice to use and you mark off a box corresponding to the number you choose. So for example, uh, we start on top here. I don't know if you can see my cursor moving yeah, here. Yeah, I can see it, I can see it. Cool. Uh, so let's say that we roll a, you know, a, a a three and a six, for example. So I can use the three, I can use the six, and no matter what I use, my opponents can use the same number or a different number. doesn't matter. Okay. So if I use the three, I can immediately, if I want, I can rub off this three, four box over here. Uh, if I use the six, I can rub off the five, six box here or mark it off. Mm -hmm. I don't even have to. If I want, I can drop a zone. I can immediately go to the bumpers down here. If I want, I can immediately go to the drop target. But basically, once I choose a number... I want to mark off a box or fill a box containing that number. And you notice the little pinball tokens here. That's where you move the pinball to show what zone you're in. Okay. So here, Carnival has four zones. You have the Ferris wheel zones, the bumper zones, the drop target, and then the flipper zones. So you're always rolling two dice. When everyone's ready, you re-roll the, the dice again. You choose a number, and you keep marking off boxes. You eventually get down to the flipper and you can mark off boxes in the flipper zone, and you use the flippers like in a pinball machine to send the ball back up. You don't have to send the ball to the highest zone. You can send the ball anywhere you wish. But if you okay. notice... Okay, so once you start to drop back down, you cannot go back up until, you, until the flippers send you back. 
Exactly. Yep. Because gravity sends the ball down and you can't send it back up until the flipper. Interesting. And this is where the colors also matter. You have notice you have a red flipper and a yellow zipper. Yeah. Uh, zipper. Flipper. Uh, so the red flipper sends the ball to any feature that's white or red. So, for example, this red flipper could hit the red drop targets here. It could hit the feet of strength targets over here. It could hit the bumpers over here, but it could not go up this yellow alleyway and hit the Ferris wheels because it's a red flipper. So you have so also where you want the ball to land or where you can land and where you mark off, you have to decide where you're trying to hit next. Because, for example, let's say I'm in the flipper zone and I have to mark off a three. Well, or let's say, uh, yeah, let's say a three. So I go, oh, do I want to mark off the yellow flipper three or the red flipper three? Where do I want to go next? Right. So you want to try to figure out what you can do there. Um, right. So you're hitting the targets. Uh, a lot of like like in a pinball, when you drop a set of targets, they pop back up. This is represented by if you knock all, let's say the duckies targets here. If you get all three here, you get to erase them and you get a bonus, which is listed here. And you can get a multi ball. You can get a flipper pass uh, or you can hit two feet of strength targets. So you can go up here and knock down two targets, two targets here and score. Notice the little stars here. That tells you how many points to mark off, which is you do on the back glass over here. Right, right, uh, right. And and then there are rules for the type of boxes. So a single border box is part of a set usually. And the sets could be a set of one up to like a set of six. And actually uh, over here with the bumpers, it's a set of 12. So you don't erase anything until all 12 of these bumper boxes uh, are uh, marked off. Uh, and then they become reusable again. Um, a double line box means it's not erased for the uh, rest of the game. So, for example, if I knock down the duckies targets and I choose the multi-ball bonus, I can't choose the multi-ball bonus again. Uh, the dash boxes are erased at, at the end of each round. Okay. And that's the game. The game is three rounds. And when you lose a ball, that's when the round is over. Oh, okay, uh, and, okay. But you immediately start the next round. So the next roll is you erase all the dash boxes, uh, any sets you keep, a double bonus you don't uh, erase, uh, and um, yeah, you don't have yeah. to wait for everybody to you don't have to wait for everyone to lose a ball to jump right back in. You exactly. never, there's no turns. You're always going, basically. Exactly, you're always going, and that's why in this game, uh, sometimes. Someone will be either uh, it, it, like could be in round one while you're in round two because you lost the ball and yeah. they're still going with theirs. Yeah. So at the end of the third round, you you stop playing while the others finish. That's cool. But we, we notice that very rarely. Uh, I mean, the game soon ends because you are limited in the flipper boxes. Sure. So I mean, you're going to run out of boxes in a moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're cool. not waiting a half hour for your opponent to, to finish there. Well, this sounds uh, very thematic. I got to say, it's interestingly thematic. Every I, I could see this being... I always look for games that I'm going to have an easier time teaching if I utilize the theme provided. Yes. You know, yes. I want to be able to get across what I want to teach by using the lingo, the terminology, and just the clues built into a game. This is filled to the brim with clues. <laughs> you know, I can just yes. tell you why this works the way it works. Why the right. ball can't go back up because it's falling. When you hit it with a flipper, you can send it back. So, yeah, it's it's great. I, I really like the, uh, the implications of the theme here are really working for me. Oh, thank you, thank you. Very yeah. cool. And there's a couple of things. I just one other thing. Like, there's even skill shots you can get. So if you knock down, if you get all three Ferris wheel boxes, you get a skill uh, a skill shot. A skill shot allows you to replace one of the dice with the number that you circle that you chose as your skill shot, and you can okay. have multiple skill shots. So let's say you know you roll a one and a four, and it's like, oh man, I really need that five. Oh, I got a skill shot of five. Boom! I could turn one of those dice for myself. Right. Into a five you can and, bank, and you can bank a, a number, yeah. Yes. So this is Carnival. I'll just, uh, as a quick thing, just show you, we'll have the other tables, which we've never really shown anyone. Uh, so this is, I think, the first time. Here's Cyberhack. So this is a, uh, a cyberpunk theme. And on the back glass is actually a mini, uh, a mini game on the back glass. Okay. Uh, so you can, so when you get these three bumpers on the table, the run, you actually start a run mini game. And then you start uh, marking off these boxes here for extra points. Um, as another quick thing uh, to show, the next one is Dance Fever. So we have a nice 70s disco theme uh, with another <laughs> mini play field up here on the back glass. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, I see it. 
then finally, uh, we have Dragon Slayer. So we actually have a fantasy theme thing where you're going after a dragon horde, and actually you can cast spells as well, and they wow. do things. So yeah, really, uh, really a lot of different uh, uh, table, and they're all different difficulty. Uh, Carnival is the easiest. Dragon Slayer and Cyberhack are moderate, and actually Dance Fever is the the hardest of them. All right, very cool. Yeah, this looks great. Thank you. Yes, and that one, this should be uh, August September as well. All right, August September for that one. Yeah, All right, we're really, Zev. really excited about this one. Let's uh, talk about Gates of Mara, and then we'll do um, yeah, let's do Gates of Mara fairly quickly. Waddle downtown, and then we'll call it at that point. You good with that? We'll mention. Oh, good with that. We'll mention the other two things. Okay. We'll just talk about the uh, the other the last two things. All right. Sounds good. Let me get a uh, let me get some Mara images up. All right. Yeah, you do that. While you're doing that, I'll, I'll state again everything we've talked about here, folks. If you missed it. If you're just joining us, make sure you go back later on and check this out. We talked about Stampede, an animal stamp collecting game in which you're going to be trading with your opponents. We talked about uh, Crazy Something 2D Arcade Mega Fighter. Uh, <laughs> that name is insane. Is that insane? <laughs> that one is uh, a, a head to head game with uh, some uh, pixelated artwork. That's sort of, you know, uh, old school artwork. Red Cap Ruckus, a, a dexterity game. Seastead, we talked about two player games set in the world of Flotilla and uh, Super Skill Pinball, you just saw. Now we're going to be talking about Gates of Ma Is it Mara? Yep, Gates of Mara. Here we go. Let's take a look at that. I'm loving that cover. It's very cool. Thank you. Uh, All right, yes. Zeb, what is this? Uh, so, this is uh, by the uh, designer uh, JB Howell. He's the uh, co designer of uh, Flotilla. Uh, this is a worker placement. Uh, area uh, influence, area majority uh, uh, type game, or uh, more area influence uh, okay. type. Uh, you are, um, uh, just as a short thing, uh, gates open every hundred years to the elemental uh, realms, and you're trying to, to exert influence and trade within those realms for another hundred years of peace. Yeah, uh, so everybody knows that. That's that's common. Everybody knows that, and everybody wants a piece. Yes, everyone wants peace. Uh, <laughs> so there are. Uh, this is a, a setup for a four player. Uh, so you notice the different realm boards. Cool. Uh, and obviously, with the less players, you take away a board. There's always the chaos realm, the gray board. Okay. Uh, and then you would take away one of the others. You have earth, fire, uh, water, air. The things in the middle here are um, uh, standard gates. These are gates that connect two realms, okay. and then you have the central gate, which connects all realms. All right. Uh, if you notice the, the shapes, for example, the central realm has a triangle, the, uh, the, the standard has a triangle and a square, and then on the realms themselves, they have triangle, square, and circle. Uh, why that's important is because you will have figures. Uh, yep, as you can see, these are the figures. There are four tribes in the game. Okay. Uh, and each of the figures have a particular base shape. That tells you where you can place them. So the circle, the figures with the circles, they're usually uh, your uh, merchants and specialists. Uh, they, they can be placed only on a realm. Your champion over here with the square can be placed on the in between two realms. Right. And the uh, the leader uh, is a triangle. He can pla be placed on either the central gate, the standard gate, or the or the realm. Uh, what's interesting is, for example, the leader. If you put him on a realm. He's worth three influence on a realm. If you put him on a center in a, in a, um, a standard gate, he, he he puts two influence in the two realms that are connected. But if you put, put him in the middle in the uh, central gate, he's worth one influence on all the realms. Right. So the, the there's an inverse uh, thing on how strong a character is depending on where he's focused, uh, uh, where the the figure is focused. Interesting. Interesting. And then you have enchanters. Enchanters have an, a hex base. They can only be placed on an enchanter board. Uh, enchantment board allows you to buy enchantments, which are these cards here. Okay. So notice you can spend uh, elements here. And what you do is you attach enchantments uh, to figures so that when you place a figure on the board, you can also activate their ability. This is an interesting worker placement in that uh, the value of the worker placement is... Uh, you have to pay to place the worker okay. as well. 
So it's not uh, so the value is not just only on where you place the, the thing. It's the worker itself has a value. So you have to pay to put a, uh, a worker on the board. The worker itself has some abilities. And then where you place it also has abilities. And if the worker has any uh, has any enchantments or banners or other things attached to it, they also have those abilities. So there is an yeah. engine building going on because depending on what you put on a figure and then activating that figure, you get to do a bunch of different things. Yeah, you're modifying. I mean, throughout the game, you're actually modifying not the places where they go, but the, but they're the powers of the workers. Exactly. Exactly. Right. You can because you can't modify the places where they're going. Uh, so here, just as uh, this shows you the the player board. So Ooh. yeah. So you can see. Like under each figure, there's the the cost shows you like energy. It's all energy. Uh, so for example, this leftmost figure over here costs one energy to activate. And then when you place it, uh, you can see you spend something and you get one influence. For example, um, and then and the same thing for all the figures. So everyone has the same seven types of figures. You get uh, two enchanters. You have your champion, your leader. You have a specialist and two merchants. Uh, so that's the thing on the uh, on the board. And then you have what's called uh, caravans. Caravans can also be placed on a realm for special abilities because on the realm itself, in the caravan spaces, mm -hmm. there's uh, 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 something you can gain. But only, there's only a few ways to get a caravan on. Usually the leader, you can pay, if you notice down here, one energy allows you to place a caravan. But again, it, it comes as part of activating the, the champion. Uh, and then there are some banners and other cards that allow you to... Um, uh, put a, a caravan on. Uh, you also have claim tokens. This is when you have uh, influence because at the end of a round when everybody passes, uh, then you go to each realm and you see who has the most influence. The person with the most influence gets a place two claim tokens, second okay. most one. And at the end of the game, uh, then you do majority. Who has, who has the most claim on each realm and you get points for that. You also get points for the most keys. You get uh, points... Uh, for uh, your gems and so on and so forth. So many, uh, many different things going on. Right. Here's a, uh, a close-up of a realm board. Uh, so here you can see where you place your claim tokens. You have your influence track going around here. This is when you place your caravan. So if I place my caravan here, I get an extra influence. Okay. Uh, if I place a figure on any of these spots, it shows you that for one energy, I can claim a banner on the left and the right. If I put it in the middle, I can get one energy and I can get three fire gems or two earth gems. Okay. Uh, and again, each, and each realm has different uh, resources. They're all banners there. Their merchant spaces are a little different, and what you gain is a little different. And it looks so, like yeah. you—it looks like you flip over the board if you're playing with a, a different number of players. Uh, that one says three plus. Uh, so not, uh, not flip over. You remove a board. You, re you remove. Oh, that one would be out if they were playing with two players, I guess. Uh, yeah. So that yeah, must well, be what that means, right? Yeah, you always have the chaos realm, but you choose the others randomly. Oh, okay. okay. So, yeah, so Very you never nice. know what you got. And then you have just one thing: you have ele elemental lords that are in the game, and they're in the realms, and they give you special powers when you place in their realms. And then you have a wanderer. The wanderer is like a, a marketplace dude where you can start exchanging some uh, uh, some elements for a different element. Uh, so that can help you out if you're looking for a particular thing. So that's Gates of Mara. Two to four players takes about ninety minutes to two hours to play a very heavy uh uh not very heavy but a heavy euro uh style game yeah it's got a lot going on i, I it looks good i love the i love the look of it uh when is this coming out uh october this this was gonna be like an essen release that's what we right. were shooting for. Right. so but we're still gonna release it in october all right sounds good that's uh much different from most everything else we've taken a look at here today and I'd even wager that the next thing we're taking a look at is uh, back to back to what we've been seeing, the kind of game we've been seeing, because it's called Waddle Downtown. I'm guessing it's not a very heavy, you know, 18xx style game, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> you are not wrong. <laughs> you know your you know your games. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna get the images here. No I'll problem. Get... Yeah, I'm I'm on our screen right now, letting you scroll. So that people don't have to sit through that bit. That's no problem. So, uh, so just like this. so, Waddle is uh, actually uh, it's two designers. Uh, you have uh, Isaac Shalev is one of the designers. The other one is Raf uh, Koster, uh, and a lot of people may know the name. He was like the lead designer of Ultima Online, 
and he was like creative director for Star Wars Galaxies. Wow. So very well known in the uh, in the uh, the video field, we'll say the the video game field. Right, right, right. Uh, so this was an abstract uh, which we uh, t- uh, we applied a theme to it. Uh, okay. And I, okay, I got the cover up now. There we go. Let's take a look at that. Look at that. Oh my goodness, it's adorable. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So Waddle Downtown. Yep. It is uh, uh, a two to four player game. It is about penguins about town. Uh, you're, uh, the penguins are very, very curious and they're going to, uh, various locations. Uh, let me just see how far I go. No, we'll do that. Let's see. We have it. So these are some of the locations. There are five different locations. Uh, so the museum, a restaurant, uh, like an opera house or something. Uh, so they're very curious. You can see them doing all sorts of crazy little things here. Okay. Um, so these are some of the places, uh, here's a couple of, you got the aquarium and the library as well. Um, this is them on the board. So you can see there's going to be penguin meeples there. Wow. Okay. Uh, and okay. So this, I wanted to get you to the cards here. So on your turn, you're going to play a card and you're going to try, uh, you're going to score that card. So for example, let's say I play odd. If I play odd, I'm going to score places with one, three or five penguins. So I get to place a card first and then I have, I have an action. I, I, I can either... Uh, I can either take any penguins I happen to have in my supply and put them in a set of places in one neighborhood. Okay. Uh, and again, it depends on the number of players. In two player, there is one neighborhood. In three and four players, there are two neighborhoods. Uh, and they were uh, on the places you saw some light colored and dark colored borders. Yes. That represents the neighborhoods. Yes. Um, so you put them in a neighborhood and then you score. So obviously you're going to use your action to help you score the most you can uh, on your card. The other thing you can do is not only, e- I'm sorry, you can either, as I said, take as many penguins from your supply and put them on the board, or you can empty a place of penguins. So you take all the penguins of one place and you distribute them into one neighborhood any way you want, but just in one neighborhood, and then you score your card. Okay. And then you turn this over. Everyone has the same hand of cards. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Everyone has the same deck of cards. Uh, but you draw, uh, I think, four cards uh, into your uh, up to four cards in your hand, and when you play a card, you draw a card. So okay. you, even though you have the same deck, you may not have the same type of cards currently in your hand. Right. Uh, the one restriction is you can't play a card that's already is that's face up in someone's discard pile. So if you have a card uh, on the top of your discard pile, let's say you had odd, I could not play odd until you covered it with something else, and then I could play odd. Yeah, you can't piggyback um, that that obviously on my exactly. play. Right, right, right. That's that's the big thing, yes. So the main thing is playing the card, distributing the penguins either from your supply or from a place, and then scoring the, co- uh, the so card. So how do you how do you get new penguins in your supply? Uh, you, everyone starts with four. There is a card that allows uh, a player to, when they remove penguins they can distribute penguins to players but usually once you use all the penguins in your supply uh you don't have any more uh, now you got to move the ones in play move them exactly around. exactly exactly and the game is short it's like a, a like a 20 30 minute game uh sorry i went too far that way uh so yeah there, and there's uh, i think 13 cards in the game and you're only playing uh eight uh, depending on the number of players uh like uh, uh, I think six round of uh, six rounds or seven rounds, eight rounds, uh, something like that. So yeah. you're never playing all your cards, okay, uh, and so on. So this is like one neighborhood over here. You can see the the waddle and just on the other coast. So here and they're all double sided. So you'll see their dark uh, colored uh, uh, neighborhood, a light colored uh, neighborhood, and some have the split because in a three player you have three of one color, two split color, and then three of the other color. Okay. And the two car- the two places in the middle share can be in either uh, neighborhood. Yeah, so you'll see in this That sounds picture. interesting. That sounds like a nice wrinkle to the game. Yeah, very, very, di- you know, different, uh, uh, a nice theme to an abstract, but very, you know, thinky. You know what I mean? Kind of thinky. It's like, oh, how do I move the penguins to score the, op- you know, to, to optimally score my card? That's what you're trying to get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's nice. That looks very nice. It looks like a great family game. This is, Thank yeah, you. and the look is just, this is going to be an easy, <laughs> easy sell. You know what I mean? This game, gotcha. anybody who looks at it, they, they want to they take this game and, and mess with it and play with it. 
So, Absolutely. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Very nice. All right, Zev, let's cut back to us up here. When is this little guy coming it's, out, by the way? Uh, good question. I think later in the year. I don't, I don't, uh, for some reason, I don't remember. Uh, but I think it's later in the year. So holidays, uh, I, holidays I, gift. Yeah, right it probably there. is holidays. Yeah, it probably is October, November. All right. Uh, if that, I'm wrong, I apologize. Put that, uh, give somebody that gift, folks. All right, we've got a couple more things, but we're just going to talk about them. We're going to wrap this yes. up. I love, before we started doing this, folks, I told Zev, Zev, we'll go for about 10 minutes. We'll just do a quick, <laughs> we'll knock out a little interview about 10 minutes. Yeah, I, what I meant was an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I meant. You knew that, but that's what I meant. Um, all right, so a couple of other things we'll just talk about, Zev. Uh, Fantasy Realms is getting an expansion. Love Fantasy Realms. So it's getting an yes. expansion, right? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Um, and it's just more cards, more ways to score, I'm guessing, new combos, all that good stuff. Uh, it actually has uh, three new suits. Uh, which So it's in two modules. It's three new suits, and there's also Cursed Items, which is a separate deck. Cool. Uh, so curse items, you uh, always have one in front of you. If you use it, it goes face down. You get another one. Or any any uh, used ones uh, will score at the end of the game. They're usually negative because they do some uh, crazy things. Uh, but that's your curse items. And okay. then the three new suits, uh, we have buildings, outsiders, and undead. Uh, what's interesting about the undead, the undead will help you score the cards in the discard area. Cool. Wow. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very different. So that's going to be probably yeah. early twenty one, probably quarter one, uh, uh, early twenty one. So okay. yeah, about forty seven new cards, uh, and yeah, as you said, it's it's new cards to be used in the two modules, and you can mix and match. So you can add both modules, play one sure. module, and so on. Yes. Cool. And then the other thing is the new printing of Clash of Cultures, the new edition of that. New edition, uh, yeah, the monumental edition. Monumental edition. That's it, and that's uh. For those of you that don't know, it's a game that, that was out before, has been out. It's a big epic game, Clash game, of course, uh, that you are, uh, with WizKids, bringing back to our tables. Correct, correct. Big, uh, it's a civilization game, yes. Right, and that's uh, um, uh, coming out when? Uh, that should be quarter one, uh, 21. So between January and March uh, okay. 21. Uh, yeah, it's going to encompass the original base game. And the expansion civilizations, so it's going to be a big honking box, uh, uh, probably the same as the Mage Knight Ultimate Edition box, a really big box. Right, uh, right. And it's uh, it's going to have uh, almost 350 miniatures. Uh, we're also uh, including eight wonders in the game, and they're going to be miniatures this time. In the uh, original, they were uh, standees, so mm -hmm. this one they're actually going to be miniatures. And the other change to them is they were counted apart from cities, but now they're actually considered city pieces. So for those that know the game will understand, but basically they help increase the value uh, of your city. Um, and we, there are other uh, tweaks to the game. Uh, it's the combat a little bit. Instead of D6s, we have D12s okay. with some clash abilities. Uh, barbarians can move in this game, so no longer they just sit there and you can work around them. No, they'll start coming towards you. Um, so yeah, just a, a bunch of little tweaks there. All new sculpts, all new art. Yeah, there's uh, some. If you want to see some of the artwork, folks, you can go over to BGG, and the game is listed there. And there's a shot of the cover and some of the concept art. I, absolutely, yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah, so we're looking stuff. forward to that as well. All right, well, Zev, it's been a pleasure, my friend. I love talking to you, getting to hang out a little bit, even if it's virtually. So uh, I know, I know. It's really good seeing you. Thanks, thanks for uh, coming by. Thanks for telling us all about all of your wonderful games coming up. Like I said, folks, stay tuned to WizKids. They've got games for everybody. You want silly fighting games? They've got them. Kids games, family games, uh, roll and rights, big epic clashing games, all sorts of things. Zev, you're doing a wonderful job, my friend. Thank you, buddy. All right, I am going to <laughs> let you go, and I am going to finish up my own thing over here, just a little chat Q&A type thing with the audience. But I'm going to let you go, bud. You have uh, a good day. You, you too. Enjoy. All right, I will see you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks, it's going to be uh, just me here. There he goes. All right. So, 
Again, I will remind you that we have a contest going on. I will even be so nice as to tell you what it is again. We have got a contest. If you have not entered, make sure you do so. To uh, a giveaway for two copies of Imperial Settlers, Empires of the North, the Barbarian Hordes expansion. Brand new expansion, the latest expansion. We're going to give away two of those, North America only. Uh, and the way you want to enter this is by emailing us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject line, you will write Hordes, H-O-R-D-E-S. And in the body of the email, include your name and your address. In case you win, we can send you one or, uh, you know, Portal. Thanks to Portal Games for sponsoring this. So make sure you are uh, you're jumping in on this. Send us an email and you just might win this fantastic expansion. All right. If you've got any questions for me, we can talk about uh, WizKids and what we just looked at. You can, we can talk about anything you want, folks. And then I'm going to get out of here in a few minutes. This is going to be a quick one. All right. Good day, everybody. Good day. Michael, hello. All right. There we go. Uh, Jacob says, what upcoming game are you looking forward to the most? Ah, oh, gosh. Okay, let's see. Ooh, we game together is here. Hi. All right, let me see. Upcoming game I'm looking forward to the most. I'll give you two answers, okay? Because it's hard to keep it all in my head. I'm going to tell you the one for, for WizKids I'm looking forward to the most because I it's fresh in my head. And then I'm going to tell you one that I'm looking forward to getting my hands on the most and owning, even though it will be a reprint, okay? The, uh... The one I want to get that is a reprint is Aquatica. Aquatica is going to be picked up. Uh, it's actually part of, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's part of Tom's uh, Dice Tower Essentials. So that's going to be coming out again, be available again. I'm, that's, I'm happy with that because I want to get a copy of it. I want to have my own copy. So I'm very excited about that. I have played it. I played it one time with uh, my friend Mike Delisio. Great game. I want to have it. So that's coming. I'm excited for that. But of all of these games we just looked at, uh, between Stampede, Arcade, Mega Fighter, Red Cap, Ruckus, Seastead, all of these things, I think the one that looks the most for me is Seastead. Two-player only game. Kind of gives me a vibe of, uh, of Abyss. This idea of the more I want, the more I give you. You know, it's got that push and pull. So I'm excited for that one. Seastead sounds like it's right up my alley. I haven't played Flotilla. So maybe I should play Flotilla first just so I have a, a familiarity with that world. But I'm looking forward to it. Uh, all right, let's see. What game are you most looking forward to playing this week? Gosh, what have I got left? All uh, right, hold on. Uh, what have I got left? Let's see. I've got left... Uh, I played 8-Minute Empires. That was one of my favorite things. So, I really enjoyed that one. Alright. Happy 4th. There we go. Hi, Liz. Good to see you. Alright, everybody. I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. We've got one more thing from Melissa McCack. Um... Let's go ahead and play that, and I'm going to see you guys a little bit later today. Again, thanks for joining us. Keep having a good time. I'm going to get out of here. See ya. What's up, everyone? I'm Melissa McCack from Room 51, and I'm super excited to be here for the Dice Tower Summer Spectacular. I'm coming at you with my top 10 games that I find the most fun to teach. This is a very personal list to me. I personally find them fun to teach. I usually like teaching games that uh, their mechanisms have something to do with the theme, and they, uh, they, I don't feel like I have to teach everything all at once before everybody could get into it. So starting with my number 10 is Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. So this game, I like the challenge it poses to teach this game. I find it fun to just sort of like get everyone into the mood of the game, the horror 
uh, genre and everything like that. And I don't feel like I have to teach everything before uh, everybody could start playing. And there's a lot of things I don't even have to teach them at all so that I could just, I'll just sort of like kind of act as the DM and we'll just continue playing from there. All right, my number nine is Forgotten Waters. So Forgotten Waters, this one is a little bit easier to teach, I find. Uh, although it could be a little bit daunting when it's your first time playing as well and you're not quite sure what to expect. But I really like getting everybody into the whole RPG genre of gaming through uh, Forgotten Waters and just teaching them about skill checks and all that stuff and then really getting into the story of the game. For my number eight, I really enjoy teaching Marvel Legendary. This one's cool because I like that I get to teach deck building in this game. It's one that you could use as a gateway to deck building. And so I kind of like teaching that concept. And then, you know, we get to play with superheroes and everything. So it's a lot of fun. My number seven game that I like to teach is Viticulture. Viticulture is really cool because it's one of those games that it poses some sort of challenge, but I really like teaching about the flow of the game and how everything, like the mechanisms, they push forward that theme, even though it's a Euro game. And again, I don't have to teach everything right off the bat. I could teach, here's what's going on in summer, and then we could play through summer and then go into winter and all that stuff. My number six game that I like to teach is Predaporter. So Predaporter is... Um, it's not as difficult to teach that game as you might think, but I really like it because the, uh, the theme really comes through, through its mechanisms, and I could go just step by step. Hey, you go to this worker placement space, and this is what this does, and you just go down the line. It's pretty simple, even though that there's um, a lot of depth in the strategy of the game. My number five game that I like to teach is Caverna. Caverna poses some sort of challenge to teach because there's a lot going on, but it's very cool because you don't have to explain every single worker placement uh, option that there is because it comes out gradually throughout the game. So I, as I said, like I really like teaching games that I don't have to teach everything right off the back, and uh, Caverna really lets me do that. My number four game is... Fury of Dracula, mostly because then I will usually be playing Dracula if I'm teaching this game. I love playing as Dracula in this game, and I certainly don't have to teach them everything that I'm doing as Dracula, and we could get right into this awesome, meaty game by just telling them um, about their, what are they called, hunters or investigators? I think hunters. And uh, there's not all that much to explain for a hunter, so that's really cool, and you could get into this awesome, epic game right off the bat. My number three game that I really like to teach is... Scythe. Scythe I like for the challenge specifically of teaching that game. I, um, I've come up with a way that I don't quite have to teach a whole lot right off the bat uh, so that people could start getting into it. I could teach it kind of gradually and it was just a lot of fun for me specifically to figure out how best to teach this game even though Jamie uh, he added in this little card of like how to teach this game but for me I thought it doesn't, uh, I don't need to go specifically by that, but it gave me a lot of really cool ideas. My number two game that I like to teach is Robinson Crusoe. This is another meaty game that has a lot going on, but it's another one where the mechanisms match up with the theme, and I love that. I love that I get to say, like, hey, you're doing this thing because, you know, this is what we have to do. You're, you're, you might be pushing your luck in terms of like, hey, if you're not putting all your resources into that basket, well, you might not actually complete that task, which is cool. And it's also just fun to see everybody's dread on their face of when they come to the realization, there's no possible way we are winning this game. So I just find that funny. I love the theme in this game. And it's, a, again, another one. I don't have to teach everything before we get started. So, But my number one game that I really love to teach and I find a lot of fun is... Dinosaur Island. Dinosaur Island I love to teach because the game itself helps you do it. It has it all set up that everything's broken up into, I think it's four or five different phases, and each phase kind of has its own little rule set, and you don't necessarily have to teach everything before getting into everything. I usually just teach one phase at a time, and then we get right into that phase. I'll tell them about the whole flow of the game, but it's also fun because, again, the, the theme comes through with the mechanisms, and I love that. Um, and it's just a lot of fun, usually, for people to get to like build their own amusement park. And that's really why I love teaching games in the first place, getting people into the game and getting them excited to play that game. So that is my top 10 list of games that I find fun to teach. 
Uh, I would love to know what you find fun to teach. Uh, so let me know in the live chat or whatever is going on. Anyway, enjoy your the rest of your summer. Spectacular. I'll catch you next time. You answered the letter. Now, like me, you are a part of this place.